Warning, some viewers may be too lame to enjoy the following information. At Six Flags Great Adventure, King Daka is now open. Today, trains are loading. Today, people are launching at an incredible 128 miles per hour and soaring 456 feet in the air. Today, ride the tallest, fastest roller coaster on Earth because King Daka is now open. Buy one, get one free admission Monday through Thursday with a can of Coke. Don't wait. Ride King Daka today. Well, King Daka may be open and loading trains when you visit, but the ride is closed very often, so good luck. That's an overdramatic commercial from 2005 when King Daka first opened as the world's tallest and fastest roller coaster at Six Flags Great Adventure in Jackson, New Jersey. The ride stands 456 feet tall and launches guests to 128 miles per hour in just three and a half seconds. King Daka opened towards the end of the roller coaster wars and stole the height and speed record from top thrill dragster at Cedar Point, which was previously the world's tallest and fastest roller coaster when it opened in 2003. 15 years later in 2020, King Daka is no longer the world's fastest roller coaster, but still remains the world's tallest roller coaster. It's also still the fastest roller coaster in North America. The world's fastest roller coaster actually uses the same launch system that King Daka does, but accelerates from 0 to 149 miles per hour in 4.9 seconds. The ride goes by the name Formula Rosa and operates at Ferrari World in Abu Dhabi. In this video, I will be giving you my review of King Naka, as well as an in-depth technical analysis from a ride operator's perspective. I actually operated King Naka for the entirety of the 2015 season, so I know the ride very well. I saw the ride on its good days and also on its bad days. King Naka is one of the most unreliable roller coasters on the planet and unfortunately spends a large amount of time closed. This video serves as a part 2 to my prior video about Top Thrill Dragster, as King Naka is the exact same ride model as Dragster, but includes some cool upgrades over its predecessor, which I will discuss in this video. Let's dig in. King Naka is themed to a mythical Southeast Asian Bengal tiger. It is named after one of the park's Bengal tigers that goes by the name King Naka. If you aren't familiar with Great Adventure, the park operates a large safari and animal exhibit within the park. Apparently, King Naka means King of Coasters in Swahili, but Google Translate says otherwise. But whatever this made-up name means, it does sound really cool. Great Adventure built King Naka in what was formerly part of the parking lot. How fancy. The ride was placed next to the former Rolling Thunder roller coaster, which used to run alongside the former edge of the parking lot. Now even though King Naka was built on the parking lot, Great Adventure did a phenomenal job transforming the area into the Golden Kingdom, a jungle-like section which was built to cater in the new attraction. King Naka and the Golden Kingdom were built during a different era of Six Flags, when the company poured way too much money into their parks and built up a large amount of debt. The park's former kiddie section, Bugs Bunny Land, was transformed into Balin's Jungle, which hosted a collection of kiddie attractions within the Golden Kingdom. Overall, King Naka and the Golden Kingdom were actually the first step towards transforming Great Adventure from a regional amusement park into a destination theme park resort. Plaza del Carnival and El Toro would follow up as the second step towards this goal in 2006. However, new management took over Six Flags around this time period, with the risk of bankruptcy being so high, management canceled this plan for Great Adventure. I hear that 2007 would have saw the addition of a hotel for the Great Adventure property, but obviously, that never happened. Unfortunately, Six Flags management and years of neglect haven't been kind to the Golden Kingdom. Ballin's Jungle would close in 2009 due to low ridership and staffing issues. This also led to the pathway between Plaza del Carnival and the Golden Kingdom closing for years. It's a shame because the area truly was the nicest in the park when it opened, but I can't say the same anymore. Now the Golden Kingdom isn't in total disrepair, but it's nothing like how it used to be. I hope that one day, Six Flags management will put money back into the Golden Kingdom to fill in the empty space left by the removal of Balin's Jungle, and to cut down some of the bamboo that has now completely blocked King Daka's launch track from the midway and queue line. Now let's move into a less depressing topic, King Daka's ride experience itself. Guests begin their journey by boarding into one of King Naka's four trains. King Naka used to operate all four trains at the same time, but now only operates three trains at most. I'll get into that later in the video when I go over the modifications King Naka has received over the years. The ride features an over-the-shoulder restraint system, rather than the T-bar shaped lap bars used on Top Thrill Dragster. Overall, I don't find these restraints terrible, but they don't match the quality of Top Thrill Dragster's lap bars, which offer a very open and unrestricted ride experience. I hear one of the reasons King Naka features over-the-shoulder restraints is because of an amusement park regulation in the state of New Jersey, which requires that all rides over the height of 400 feet to feature an over-the-shoulder type restraint. Riders are dispatched from the station. 
The ride passes over a transfer track and heads into the launch track. Once the ride is ready to launch, the operator at the main control panel will hit the two launch buttons, which begins the ride's launch sequence. The train's launch dog drops down as hundreds of magnetic brake fins lower into the launch track and the train rolls backwards a few inches so that the launch dog locks into the catch cart. Then after a brief pause, the train begins to accelerate down the launch track. Unlike Top Thrill Dragster which seems to accelerate in one continuous pull, King Ka accelerates almost in pulses, kind of like a car changing gears. Many prefer the continuous acceleration found on Top Thrill Dragster, but I find that King Ka's launch is overall more intense as it accelerates more quickly than Dragster does. Now King Ka's overall ride experience is rougher than Top Thrill Dragster's and I will explain why I think that is later in the video. Its launch isn't the smoothest. If you're sitting further back in the train, you can actually feel it swaying side to side. But the front car is glass smooth, so if you'd like the smoothest ride possible, I'd sit towards the front. You'll also enjoy the amount of wind that blows at your face in the front row. Now even though the launch track seems very long on King Ka, trains only accelerate for about 3 quarters of the launch track. The remainder of the launch track is space for the catch car to slow down. The catch car is what actually hooks onto the train to launch it to speed. There are actually magnetic brakes built just for the catch car that are in the launch track to slow it down. So when riding the coaster, it's very noticeable when the acceleration cuts off and the train begins to just coast down the launch track at extremely high speeds. The train pulls up into the 456 foot tall top hat delivering bone crushing g-forces, even more so than what Top Thrill Dragster delivers. Overall, I've always found that King Ka offers a more intense experience than Top Thrill Dragster and this is just another reason why. The train doesn't complete the pull up until it's 228 feet in the air, which is nearly the height of Nitro, another roller coaster at Great Adventure which stands 230 feet tall. After the train rattles through the pull up, the ride rotates 90 degrees clockwise as it ascends up the tower vertically. You can feel the train slowing down immensely as it begins to crest the top hat. Riders in the front of the train will receive a good dose of airtime as this happens. Now the slightest alteration in how fast King Ka launches will affect how fast it crests the top hat. Sometimes the train flies over the top hat and other times it crawls over it. When the ride crawls over the top, don't expect too much airtime. But when the ride flies over the top hat, you will get a good dose of airtime for sure. The train begins to descend back down the top hat but hits a small trim brake which holds the speed steady instead of allowing the train to cascade freely. In effect, this kills the whip and airtime you'd normally get in the back rows. However, I believe this trim brake is here for a reason and I will get into that during the more technical part of the video. The train leaves the trim brake and begins falling freely through the vertical 270 degree heartline roll. The ride picks up speed quickly and rotates faster and faster as it falls. Riders towards the back of the train will get a good chop to the neck as their heads fly into the over the shoulder restraints due to the lateral forces. The train exits the roll and hits a tight pullout. This pullout is long and provides a strong amount of positive g-forces. You can feel the entire train rattling as it does this. The ride then flies over a drawn out quote unquote bunny hill which I think delivers some decent floater airtime. I say quote unquote bunny hill because on a normal roller coaster, this 129 foot tall hill would be a full sized element, but on King Ka, this 129 foot tall hill is super small compared to the 456 foot tall top hat. Many will complain that they receive no airtime on the bunny hill and I find this absolutely true if you are stapled. But I still feel the airtime in the rest of my body since the hill is so sustained if that makes any sense. Pay attention to your arms next time. I find that if I leave them in a neutral state they naturally float upwards and then the airtime instantly becomes recognizable to me. The train exits the airtime hill and enters a smooth magnetic brake run that brings the train to a near stop. The ride completes a 180 degree u-turn and then re-enters the station building which ends the ride. Overall, King Ka is a shocking attraction that definitely delivers on its claim as the tallest and fastest roller coaster in North America. The launch is out of this world and the height of the ride is mind boggling. It's not the best attraction, but I'd say it's easily one of Great Adventure's top attractions and it's one of the most exciting coasters I've ever been on. I still prefer Top Thrill Dragster overall, but just slightly as the coasters are really similar when it really comes down to it. I'd say Top Thrill Dragster offers a better theme and ride placement, while King Ka offers the more intense ride experience. Now if King Ka were to add lap bars and ditch the trim brake at the top of the tower, I think I'd prefer Ka. Now speaking of Top Thrill Dragster, let's get into some of the upgrades that King Ka features over Dragster. Top Thrill Dragster was the second hydraulic launching roller coaster built by Intimate. The very first was Accelerator at Knott's Berry Farm. 
King Nakao would be Intamin's fourth iteration of the ride model, as Intamin also opened Stormrunner at Hershey Park in 2004, which was their third hydraulic launching coaster. One thing that Intamin improved immensely with King Nakao compared to Top Thrill Dragster is its brake run. Both coasters use a magnetic braking system, which is miles better than a traditional friction brake system. However, Top Thrill Dragster's brake run is too flat, which leads to inconsistent operations when trains are empty of riders or running slow. Oftentimes, trains will crawl through the fixed magnetic brake fins, which wastes time. On the other hand, King Nakai uses its airtime hill as a method to improve the consistency of its brake run. The airtime hill allows King Nakai's brake run to slope downwards much more than it does on Dragster. This allows empty or slow moving trains to clear the brake run much faster, which helps the ride waste less time as it waits for slow trains to move through the brake run. I also believe that King Nakai was designed to roll back less often than Dragster. I think the main reason the trim brake exists on King Naka is because trains were intended to fly over the top hat. The trim was then designed into the ride to limit lateral forces as the ride dropped through the heartline roll. King Naka does not launch at the speed it's advertised to. I won't say the exact speed here as I don't want Great Adventure's marketing team to hate me, but the speed is not 128 miles per hour. But it still does launch faster than Top Thrill Dragster, which also doesn't launch at its advertised speed of 120 miles per hour. The only reason I know how fast both rides launch is because I've operated both coasters and the ride's computers list how fast the ride launches every time. At least King Naka does, Dragster's a little bit different. But on King Naka and Top Thrill Dragster, empty trains require more speed to clear the top hat than a fully loaded train does because they have less momentum. Check out my prior video about Top Thrill Dragster where I talk about speed reduction in more detail. The reason I say trains were intended to fly over the tower is because even when an empty train launches at less than 128 miles per hour, it flies over the tower. This means that a fully loaded train would fly over the tower even faster if it were to launch at the same speed. So the ride is programmed to launch fully loaded trains even slower, which takes us further from the advertised speed of 128 miles per hour. So rather than launch the ride at its advertised speed, I hear the park has slowed down the launch to save on wear and tear. Instead, they just launch the ride fast enough so it clears the tower, just how Dragster does. Apparently, Intamin did not beef up the launch system enough, so running the ride at its full speed over and over would be far too demanding. So to me, it seems that the trim brakes at the top of King Naka's tower were supposed to be a part of an upgrade to King Naka to limit rollbacks that never saw the light of day. It would be really neat to see King Naka operate without the trim brake. The vertical drop would certainly have ejector airtime like Top Thrill Dragster does, and the bunny hill would probably have stronger airtime as well. The launch tracks on both rides are a little different too. Both Dragster and King Naka begin their launch at ground level, but at the ends of each launch track, King Naka is nearly double the height off the ground than Dragster's launch track is. The difference in height is quite noticeable when you stand next to the two rides. Let's use some math to analyze this. So on both rides, the entrance and exit to either top hat start and end at about the same height for each ride. So the entrance and exit to the top hat on Top Thrill Dragster is the same height, and then for King Naka, the entrance and exit for its top hat is at the same height. Taking this into consideration, Dragster stands 420 feet tall and features a 400 foot drop, and King Naka stands 456 feet tall and features a 418 foot drop. This means that Dragster climbs vertically 400 feet following its launch, and King Naka travels vertically 418 feet. So in a sense, even though King Naka is 36 feet taller than Dragster, it only climbs 18 feet higher into the air. At the end of Dragster's launch track, it is roughly 20 feet off the ground, while King Naka's is about 38 feet off the ground. Now why would Intamin do this? I believe for one, they wanted to make King Naka's launch track end higher in the air, because while the goal was to make the ride taller than Dragster, they wanted to do so while also minimalizing how far in the air the train actually needed to climb against gravity. As the higher the ride goes, the more sensitive it is to rollbacks, which I believe Intamin was trying to avoid altogether. The added height of King Naka's launch track also increases the upward slope of the brake run. This helps to aid a train that is rolled back as it creeps backwards through the magnetic brake fins. That's actually the entire reason why launch tracks and hydraulic launch coasters are sloped upwards. Now these brake fins can be manually lowered to help trains move backwards faster, but the added slope means trains will creep backwards at a faster rate when the brakes are still applied. But raising the height and slope of the launch did have a negative effect, and it appears to make King Naka far rougher than Dragster is. On both rides, the launch track sways as trains launch, but King Naka's launch track sways far more than Dragster's does because it's higher in the air. You can visibly see the launch track swaying back and forth, which causes the train to also sway back and forth rapidly. But Dragster does not sway nearly as much, which leads to a far smoother experience. 
King Naka features vertical support columns on its launch track without any lateral bracing. So this means there's nothing to absorb the side-to-side -side motion as the train launches down the track. I believe Intamin should have designed lateral bracing into King Naka's launch track to help smoothen it out, or that the park should have the lateral bracing installed. What also doesn't help King Naka here is the design of the trains. Top Thrill Dragster's trains are very bottom heavy, because the ride has lap bars and the actual hydraulic cylinders that lock the restraints are low in the train. But King Naka's over the shoulder restraints sit higher off the ground, and the hydraulic cylinders that lock each restraint are located higher up as well, making the trains more top heavy as a result. I believe this is what causes the rattle on King Naka that isn't present on Top Thrill Dragster. From what I hear, King Naka's had this rattle since it opened, and I noticed it immediately when I first rode in May of 2007. So I don't think the rattle is due to negligence from Six Flags. In fact, the ride still feels exactly the same to me as when I first rode it in 2007. Going back to the launch tracks, it also appears that King Naka features a much longer launch track than Dragster does. On Dragster, the launch track seems to end much earlier and there is additional straight track until the ride begins to climb up the tower. But on King Naka, the launch track seems to continue right up until the train begins to climb up the tower. Another upgrade King Naka features over Top Thrill Dragster is the amount of trains it needs to run at full capacity. In their original conceptions, Top Thrill Dragster required 6 trains and King Naka only required 4 trains. On both rides, trains possess 9 rows and hold 18 riders each. Both rides are capable of 60 launches an hour, which equates to a theoretical capacity of 1,080 riders each hour. Now, roller coaster trains are expensive. If you thought your car was expensive, you'd cry if you had to purchase a train from Intamin. I do not know the exact cost, but I hear each one of King Naka's trains cost $250,000. Please correct me in the comments if you've heard otherwise. But if so, that means that Great Adventure had to spend $1 million on King Naka's trains, and Cedar Point spent $1.5 million for the same capacity. Now the reason King Naka was able to operate at the same capacity with two-thirds the amount of trains was because of the dual loading station. Intamin used a dual loading station prior on Storm Runner at Hershey Park, which loaded one train per side. Then for King Naka, the dual loading station was upgraded so that it loads two trains per side. On the contrary, Top Thrill Dragster features a separate load and unload station, which can each hold two trains. However, the separate load and unload stations require that the ride run at least five trains for it to be efficient. For a more in-depth look at Dragster's operations, please check out my prior video about Top Thrill Dragster. Going back to King Naka, the dual loading station was extremely efficient when it was used. The system was made possible with switch tracks at both the exit and entrance to the station building. Here is how it functioned. One station would dispatch its two trains into the course, while the other station loaded two trains. The two trains that were dispatched would roll forward into the launch track and transfer track. Once the second train exited the station, the computer allowed the first train to launch. The first train would launch and head up the tower. After the first train crested the tower, the second train would advance forward into the launch track. The first train would then enter the station, roll through the rear loading position, or load 2, and then park in the front loading position, or load 1. Once the first train passed through load 2, the computer allowed the second train to launch. The second train would launch, and once it cleared the tower, the switch track in front of the station would switch to allow the other station to dispatch. The switch track would lock into place when the train on the course exited the bunny hill. The other station could now dispatch both of its trains into the course. These trains would begin to dispatch as the second train from the prior set of trains returned to the station. Once the second train pulled into load 2, the computer would switch the transfer track behind the station to slide over to the other station. This would occur just as the next set of trains parked on the launch and transfer track. As these trains could not begin launching until that switch track behind the station locked into place. The next train would then launch and this pattern would repeat over and over until either the ride broke down or closed for the day. Let me explain by showing the block zones on King Naka. For those of you who are unfamiliar, a block is a section of the ride that only one train or ride vehicle may occupy at a time. At the end of a block segment is a method to stop a train in case the block zone ahead is occupied. This safety system keeps ride vehicles from colliding with each other. If you recall from my previous video on Top Thrill Dragster, Dragster was designed to have 9 block zones and instead operates with 8 block zones. With the original dual loading setup, King Naka only featured 4 block zones. These block zones were Load Station 2, Load Station 1, the Transfer Track, and the Launch Track. The brake run on King Naka was not designed to stop a train fully because it didn't need to, thus it was not considered a block. The two stations each individually had two block segments, but because only one station was truly active at a time, the ride only had four block segments in use at a single time, even if the other station possessed two additional block zones. 
Kingnika operated with the dual load stations from 2005 until 2010. I consider these years the golden era for Kingnika when it operated as designed. I found the system better than Top Thrill Dragster setup as it allowed for the same capacity while using less trains. In fact, King Naka does not even feature multi-move like Dragster does, as multi-move wasn't necessary for King Naka to hit its operational capacity. The dual load stations also allowed for continuous operation since they were parallel and separate from each other. If there was a holdup in one station due to a guest issue, the other station could continue to operate. Whereas with Top Thrill Dragster, the load and unload stations were linear instead of parallel, which means a holdup in either station stops operations altogether. In 2011, King Naka was modified so that it no longer used the dual loading stations and operated three trains through a single station platform. With this, only one of the two loading bays in the single station was used. This was done due to staffing and budget cuts. When King Naka operated with the dual load station and four trains, the ride required a very large staff. Each train required at least two attendants, so a minimum of eight attendants for all four trains and there were still other roles to fill, such as the operator at the main control panel, attendants at different positions in the line, and extra attendants who would come in for the midday swing shifts to run breaks. I hear that upwards of 14 people were required to work King Naka at a time, which is quite a lot of people to work a roller coaster, especially at a Six Flags park which typically operate with the bare minimum number of employees as possible. 14 would be acceptable for a ride at a Cedar Fair park, but not really Six Flags. To account for three train operations, Great Adventure added a fifth block zone to the ride. This block zone is directly behind the station before the rear switch track. To add the block zone, the park added a set of tire drives directly before the switch track, as the tire drive is what's necessary to stop the train. By adding this block zone, the ride now technically has a higher theoretical capacity. I mentioned earlier that King Naka was capable of launching 60 trains an hour with the dual station setup, or a train every 60 seconds. Now the launch system itself is actually capable of launching a train every 45 seconds, but the reason why it took 60 seconds is because that was how long it took trains to clear block zones. But with the addition of the new block zone behind the station, the ride is now capable of launching trains roughly every 56 seconds, or 64 trains an hour. For a few seasons, King Naka operated very well with three train operations, as the setup itself isn't all that bad. Ideally, the park staffs the ride with five attendants on the load platform. There are four attendants to check the small 18 passenger trains, and a fifth attendant who spiels to riders constantly, which helps to speed operations. While King Naka never technically hit the same hourly capacity as it did with four train operations, the ride still did very well, commonly dispatching over 45 trains an hour, which is over 800 riders each hour. Compared to four train operations, it was harder to dispatch as many trains an hour with the three train setup as trains had to be loaded much faster in order to do so. The King Naka dispatching less trains per hour isn't all that bad either. In fact, dispatching less trains every hour actually helped to increase the ride's reliability. Less launches led to less chances for downtime. As a result, the ride could actually see higher overall ridership even though it operated at a smaller capacity every hour. In 2013, King Naka saw over 1 million riders for the season, which is the only year in the ride's history that it gave over 1 million riders. And it did so with three train operations through a single load platform and without four train operations which used all four load platforms. However, King Naka would give up its capacity in 2014 when the park introduced Zumanjaro Drop of Doom, the world's tallest drop tower attraction. The ride is attached to the structure of King Naka and was meant to operate simultaneously with King Naka. Unfortunately, the state of New Jersey does not allow King Naka and Zumanjaro to operate simultaneously due to the fear of loose articles from one rider striking another rider on the opposing ride. As a result, King Naka is not able to launch a train while Zumanjaro is performing a ride cycle. The two rides' computer systems are actually connected by the turn of a key. This leads to an interface that only allows one ride to quote unquote be on the tower at once. Zumanjaro actually has movable roofs above the ride vehicles. King Naka is only given access to launch a train as long as those roofs are closed over Zumanjaro's riders. If the roofs are open, that means that riders on Zumanjaro are technically exposed to loose articles falling from King Naka riders. So Zumanjaro actually has priority over King Naka in the current scenario. Now the interface can easily be turned off, but legally both rides are only allowed to operate one at a time if both have riders. If only one ride is operating with riders, the interface can technically be turned off, but this would mean only one of the rides is open, while the other ride is cycling empty. The exact math varies, but this generally limits King Naka to 36 launches an hour, or 648 riders per hour. This number varies greatly, as it depends how often Zumanjaro dispatches. 
If Zumanjaro dispatches slowly, it means more launches for King Naka. But if the Zumanjaro crew is on a roll, it means less launches for King Naka. On average, King Naka launches about two trains for every one time Zumanjaro dispatches once. Intamin Amusement Rides manufactured King Naka and Zumanjaro. When the park added Zumanjaro, Intamin also added additional supports to King Naka. The tower itself received additional supports on the rear, and the approach and exit of the tower were beefed up as well. This is where things get a little convoluted. I hear two stories. One that these supports were added because of Zumanjaro, or also due to Hurricane Force winds, which struck the ride in 2011 and 2012 with Hurricane Irene and Hurricane Sandy. Strong hurricanes are rare in New Jersey, and Intamin may have not accounted for Hurricane Force winds during the design phase. Now, King Naka is still capable of switching back to four train operations using the dual load station. For the computer system, it's as simple as turning a key on the main control panel. The park still owns all four trains for King Naka, and the switch tracks still function as well. You won't see all four trains at once, however, as the park has adjusted its rehab program for the ride, so that one train is essentially always in refurbishment. But with the addition of Zoom and Jaro, there is no point of bringing back four train operations as the ride's hourly launch count is just too limited. Four train operations would constantly pump too many trains out at a time, whereas three train operations isn't quite as held up by Zoom and Jaro. Now, if the state eventually allows Zoom and Jaro and King Nakata to operate simultaneously, bringing back four train operations might make more sense. It's a shame because King Naka is a far more popular attraction and sees much longer wait times than Zumanjaro. I feel that Zumanjaro should have been a standalone attraction instead. I've actually heard rumors that Great Adventure originally sought to build a Falcon's Fury-like drop ride, but decided to build the world's tallest drop tower and attach it to King Naka instead. Busch Gardens Tampa then took over the Falcon's Fury project and opened the ride for themselves in 2014, the same year that Zumanjaro opened. Coincidence. I do miss the days when King Naka ran all four trains, as the massive loading platform felt alive and full of energy. Now that energy and excitement is only in one of the four loading bays, the three train operations do help the ride to run more reliably. I've found that King Naka is much more reliable nowadays than it used to be back with four train operations. King Naka and Top Thrill Dragster are infamously known for the amount of time they spend closed or broken down. Both rides utilize complex hydraulic launching systems littered with mechanical components and feature hundreds of more sensors than a typical roller coaster. A hiccup with the launch system or any one of the thousands of sensors on the ride will cause operations to stop. King Naka used to be plagued by extended periods of downtime, where the ride would stop operating entirely for months at a time. The first incident happened in June of 2005, just a few weeks after the ride's grand opening, where it suffered its worst technical fault ever. A loose bolt in the launch trough began rubbing against one of the ride's launch cables. This caused sparks to fly from the ride's launch, and the magnetic brake fins that lined the launch track were even ripped from the launch track and went flying into the ride's queue line. Thankfully, this occurred on a test run, and no one was hurt. This would shut down the coaster until the beginning of August in 2005. This also caused the park to remove the ride's original queue line, which ran underneath and near the launch track. The original queue line ran between the launch track and Airtime Hill and was extremely long. There were several sets of large switchbacks and the queue line was well decorated. The current queue line is actually the original overflow queue line and is significantly shorter than the original queue line was. The park also got rid of an observation area which was right next to the ride's launch track. I got the chance to see the ride operate from the observation area once in May of 2005 and it was a great spot to catch a good view of the coaster. The ride also closed for a large amount of time in the 2009 season when it was struck by lightning which fried several of the components used for the hydraulic launch. And then in 2011, the ride would also close for a few months. The exact reason isn't known, but I hear rumors that it may have to do with a bad cable snap during a test run. In day to day, King Naka spends much of its time closed due to small technical hiccups. It's quite common for the catch car brakes, which slow down the ride's catch car to get stuck or for the sensors that monitor these brakes to stop functioning correctly. The same thing also happens to the hundreds of brake fins that line the launch track. From what I remember, I believe 40% of the time, King Naka was closed due to technical or weather issues. I say weather because weather is also a big reason why rides like King Naka or Top Field Dragster will close. Both coasters are not allowed to operate in any type of precipitation, as even the smallest amount of rain is painful to riders because of the high speeds. Additionally, both rides will automatically shut down if winds exceed 35 miles per hour at the top of the towers. 35 miles per hour is a normal amount of wind to shut down a coaster, but because both coasters are so tall, it's much easier to hit 35 miles per hour than a ride that is 200 feet tall. Once the wind meter records winds of 35 miles per hour, the ride will automatically shut down. 
It then must wait 30 minutes without the wind meter going off until it can open again. But if the wind meter gets set off, the 30 minute timer will start over. Now even with all the downtime, Kingda Ka is actually one of the safest roller coasters you can ride. All the downtime occurs because the ride is basically too safe, and it's true. The ride is very well maintained and has its own team of around the clock mechanics and electricians who keep the ride running. Every bolt on the trains is torque checked at night to ensure the ride vehicles are held together properly. I think Kingda Ka is one of the most fascinating roller coasters out there. It's a very complex ride, and I'm very thankful that I had the chance to operate it. I 100% recommend a job as a ride operator, especially if you like roller coasters. And while it may not be the best, King Ka is one of the most exciting coasters I've ever ridden, and I only find the Top Thrill Dragster is slightly better. I hope you found this video enjoyable, and I hope it taught you something new. Let me know in the comments what you think of King Ka, and be sure to like, comment, subscribe as well. I'll see you guys in the next one. Peace.